everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Neil Ripsky of Red Jade Martial Arts. Neil is a longtime practitioner, teacher, and scholar of the arts, and he's also the author of many books, including A Compendium of Drunken Boxing, 18 Lohan Palm, Book One, The Book of Earth, and Secrets of Heavy Hands, The Iron Palm Companion. Neil, thanks for taking time out to talk to me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This will be fun. Sounds good. So the first question, the obvious first question is uh, for people that don't know your background, how and why did you get involved in the martial arts? How and why? Well, no it's a pretty similar story, I bet, to most of the guys in my generation. Yeah. I was bullied when I was a kid. Yeah. That's really how it started. Uh, I was When I was young, I had kind of a pot belly and kind of my ears were a little too big for my head for like a little too long. Oh. And, you know, kids notice those things. So I was getting beat up at school and on the school bus and things like that so i went to the local arcade one day after school and there was a poster of learn self-defense with you know the art of kung fu so i couldn't refuse and it was literally my first day that i was just in love with it there was something there that nothing else held for me i know i was a kid at the time but it's just never changed either it's, it's the most magical thing in the world to me to, to practice so it started out as a self-defense getting bullied sort of situation and then Eventually, like everyone, it eventually turns into something else, right? Because yep. if nothing else, the bullies stop, the bullies leave you alone, and then you get, you get left with the question, you know, what am I still practicing so hard for? Am I looking to fight anymore, or, you know, do I need to evolve a little bit? Right. Yeah. I think that's an experience, like you said, that a lot of us had. Um, so what was your first art? Where, where did you first start training? When, yeah, when I started, I started at the Canadian Jing Wu. So it was like the Shanghai Jing Wu kind of stuff. Um, my teacher was one of their teachers and I trained with him for about eight years, something like that. And when I became a Sifu with him, I was starting to look for another teacher. And that's when I literally just kind of ran into Master Ma. I got lucky and just, he was going to the movies and I was going to the movies. It was kind oh, of what right. happened. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, there was, I can't remember what movie it was. Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Oh, Dragon okay, the really? Okay. So yeah. You, um, yeah. how old were you about, about how old were you at that time when you met Master? Uh, when I met him, I was around 20, 20. I would guess, yeah. 20 or 21. Yeah. Something like that. And he had done a demonstration for the opening of the movie and I missed it, but wow. I got there and there were guys in Kung Fu suits. So I was like, Hey, who are you guys? What's, what are you about? I wish I would have seen it. And so I got invited to class. Right. So that's how I ended up meeting him. So the the Ma family style, could you describe it? Uh, was it a uh, was there was there a little bit of everything involved in it, or was it essentially a... now? The best way to describe it is uh, the family lived in the vicinity of Shaolin Temple, so they had bits and pieces of everything that they could get their hands on. Like they didn't have one solid lineage in like praying mantis or something like that. So instead, it was more of an eclectic folk Shaolin style. So it's got what they would call the like a system of praying mantis, not a style of it. That's what Sifu would always say, right? It's like, we don't do praying mantis, but we know a couple of their tricks. Yeah. We don't do tiger, but we know a couple of tricks. That was the idea. And using the, the guas, it uses the same bagua as bagua jiang. Uh, it uses the pre-heaven instead of the post-heaven. But what it does is it tries to take a look at all of the different variants uh, in strategy and archetype throughout your martial arts training and prepare you for all of them. So it's, it's kind of idea was to be really, really changeable and adaptable. Like it's kind of proto Bagua mm. sort of like weird Shaolin proto proto Bagua. I mean, I went on to study Bagua Zhang after mainly because I had an argument with master Ma about it because part of the Ma's system has a circle walking form in it. And I was, so I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, okay, so there's obviously a Bagua. And he was just like, absolutely not. We've never done Bagua. So anyway, I lost that argument. And when, when, you know, after, after his passing, I went and I found a Bagua teacher and I, to check, you know, and he was right. There wasn't Bagua in it, but it was a very similar, similar strategic idea that they were working on. They were just kind of coming from a, a more, more Buddhist, I guess, Shaolini kind of point of view than a Taoist one, like Dong Haichuan. Interesting. How long so eventually you... well I studied I lived with I lived with Master Ma. It was kind of like good and bad. I had a really hard uh, bit of luck and I lost my apartment right after I met him. But I had already trained at Jing Wu. So 
he cut me a deal that if I taught the kids classes, I could stay at his house, which sounds good. But then it meant I was with him all the time, which wow. also sounds good, but was not great. Yeah. You know, it's good to get a break from other humans. Yeah. He was a bit of a rough cat to live with. I mean, he's, well, he was like those, the baby boomer generation, Chinese, mm -hmm. you know, ran from the, even, you know, right. you know, his dad. Very, very hardcore. Yeah. Hardcore man. Yeah. He was hard to be around, truthfully. Yeah. Taught me a lot. Um, and then the, as far as the Moss style goes, it basically kind of turns into its pinnacle is sort of drunken. Because the idea of drunken boxing is, to take these different strategies and archetypes that you've played with and start to break them so that you start to see, if you will, where the box really is, you know, like every martial arts sort of has a set of rules. And uh, the last part of the Ma system with the drunken is taking those rules and just sort of testing them and just seeing why they exist. Like you're not trying to say, Oh, that rule is no good. It can be broken. It's more like, no, that's a really good rule. I see why we do it that way. And I can push the very limits of it to hear and no further or I'll fall apart. Right. Cause otherwise drunken is incredibly weak. If you yeah. do it, like it took me at least I'd say six or seven years before I could really fight with it, which is an enormous amount of time. Realistically, like sure. Either that or I'm a really slow learner. Also possible. <clears throat> also very possible. So was this a standard progression in, in Ma's school? Did he, did, did, were there other students that had been there before you that he sort of had trained in these basics and then, you know, gradually introduced to the drunken form? Was that? Yeah, I was, I'm actually the youngest. I was the youngest brother of everybody. <clears throat> I was the last guy that joined. Uh, let, well, last disciple. There were some public guys after me and stuff, but my older brothers all, like they were great prototypes for me because they all, um, we're done in the same way. There's sort of like, I'll be honest, all of us didn't really have ranks, but the school did, you know what I mean? Cause he had a public school, right? Mm -hmm. So his rank system and the rank system I adopted for a Jade is that there's sort of fundamental Jeepin Gong practices. Everybody does till black belt, black belt. Right. Mm -hmm. And then post black belt is now you've seen what all of the fundamentals of all of the Gong Fu we do, are let's just take a look at the things they do different so like if i throw a front kick and drunk in boxing is that a different thing than a front kick and crane and it is because they're one's a bird and one's a guy very different things they think differently they move differently so if you start to go around the guas that way you start to see there's a single technique has all of these variants which eventually sort of breaks your mold until you find you know what is the most appropriate is maybe the best word thing to do at the moment like ma would always say that <clears throat> if we were all if everybody in the room was masters and we were all practicing somebody should be able to walk in and say they all do the same style but they sure don't do the same thing yeah you know because like i'm i'm much bigger than he was for instance like my methods that i use from the ma system are different than his because like he was a small chinese guy and yeah. he was way faster than I am. So he kind of dug that type of movement. Whereas I've spent a lot more life and a lot more body. So Taiji and wrestling and things like that just made more sense to me, right? Whereas yeah. my other brother different with them too, just by their body types and their their points of view, the way their minds work. Yeah, I think so that's yeah, was, part of it is just finding out what works for you in any given style. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a time when people, I mean, styles are great, right? They're education systems. Mm -hmm. and a good education system is well refined and it's got you know prior students that have done it and it makes sense and it's working but at the same time if you say went to art school and you're learning painting you're gonna you're gonna do copies of renaissance masters and you're gonna you're gonna copy all of these people that are beautiful and famous and not one of them is your painting right because one day you have to go paint your own right, right. and i think that's what uh, that's why I like drunken is because it's that moment. It's where you get to help somebody kind of go, yeah, but isn't that your master's kung fu? Uh, yeah, I guess it kind of is. Well, how do you like to do it? Because, you know, you can sort of get away with this. And it, it's interesting because then I think that's where you see these people that are real martial artists. They, they're they expressing themselves. They're not, you know, like robotic copies of their teachers. But it takes a long time, I think, before somebody's willing to do the self work and look in and express themselves really because there's a lot of fear you know messing around with what people have told you seeing right. if it's real or not real or right or not right 
you know, and it's beautiful because our martial arts, the world we get to exist in when we practice is so great because we, it's so hard to lie to ourselves. I mean, everybody says Kung Fu, lie. we lie to ourselves all the time, but realistically, man, you and I both know, you can just walk, walk up to anybody else who's in this world and go, I think I'm really tough and they'll check for you. <laughs> yeah, too true. And they'll give you a test and see what's up. And yeah. then that's why you have such great, wonderful expressions and breakthroughs because sometimes you know what's up or sometimes they do and now something really gets going, you know, and you can learn from each other. Yeah. To me, it's just that we're all on the same we're all on the same page. We all like the same things. I think the Ma family style taught me that more than anything else is that there isn't a better style. There's just people. Right. And there's all systems of learning and they're all totally valid. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of them. They just all have their own strategies. I agree. Um, and I, one of the interesting things I think about drunken style uh, is that there is an element of uh comedy or self-deprecation in it that a lot of people I've heard you before I actually say that when you first got introduced to it you kind of didn't want to do it because you awesome. thought it was a, thought it was a little silly and I had the same experience I've only done a little bit of it myself um but it, it is initially very self-conscious and it comes across your movements look so stiff because you know you've, you've spent all this time training martial arts trying to look cool and all of a sudden you're out there you know Goofing up. Yeah, and have some power and some speed and some <laughs> what are you doing laying on the ground and flopping around. Yeah, it's really, it's you've got to really get past a lot of the seriousness and be able to play, right? Yeah. I think that's part of what's so wonderful and joyous about it is you got to play a little bit to make it work. Yeah, for sure. And, and that, that's the thing that, you know, when we talk about, you know, so called internal martial arts, everyone always talks about Shingi, you know, Bagua, Tai Chi. People don't really think of drunken as being an internal style, but it's, it's very much an internal style as far as, you know, I think the mechanics and the relaxation and the, as far as strategy goes, it's a completely different martial art as well. Um, yeah. Stylistically, it's strategy is really strange. In yeah. Comparison. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so like there's, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. So one of them, uh, one of the things that I practice when I'm doing workshops is what I call the three spheres. Yeah. So the three spheres of that you know, one, number one is I have personal space. That's my sphere. My opponent has personal space. That's their sphere. And then there's a space between us <clears throat> that is kind of the same size as personal space. And the, the two of us are kind of fighting over these three. So I kind of noticed that orthodox martial arts all seem to want to keep their sphere. And then they try to win one of the other ones. Because all you have to do is win two out of three to win, right? In a perfect world, you get all three. But like that doesn't happen much. So if I'm a Taiji guy, I'm going to be super orthodox. My sphere is you can't, you are not allowed to have that. It's absolutely off limits. And in fact, so is yours. I'm going to touch you and I'm going to take your whole spine from you, right? Drunken has the exact same idea. It's just like, okay, I have three spheres. I have to win two. I'm going to win yours and I'm going to win the one in between us. And you can do whatever you want to me. I'm just going to try to turn it to my advantage. So it's this extremely yin kind of rosho, soft-handed approach to martial arts, which is why it's so damn hard to be any good at. Because you're supposed to just get thrown. If the guy's going to throw you, then you don't stop the throw. You go, okay, I guess we're going to fall down now. Right. But if I hold on to part of you, my body weight will tear it off. Right. You know, it's right. that kind of thinking all of the time. Like, all I need to do is control your sphere in some way and the one in between us. <clears throat> and as long as I prevent damage to myself, like I'm okay, which is why it's got all the falling down and crazy right. stuff. Because essentially, by doing detang, the earth boxing, right, then you're work it's actually a form of iron body. So that when you're doing your drunken, uh, you eventually get something called cotton body, which is sort of the reverse of iron body in a way sort of just taking it rather than deflecting and that's that's the whole idea is that then i can sort of give my opponent my spear if they want to take my root that's fine have it so long as i get to punch you in the face right you know whatever happens so long as i get an advantage out of this is one way of looking at it the other thing is that ma would always tell us you're never fighting and i think it's the hardest part of the whole thing <clears throat> the only mindset allowed is you're drinking with a friend. You've both had way too much, like way too much. And that 
is where everything starts. So it's either I can't walk anymore. You have to hold me up, which is sort of how drunken wrestles on people. It just falls on them and then makes them deal with the body weight and the momentum. Or I'm not done with my drinking session with you. You should have more drinks. So that's me trying to give my my friend something more to drink, which is punching them in the face and things like that, because you're bombed. You're not quite sure what's happening. You're just offering the, the cup. But what happens is that it's really about training the archetypal mindsets, right? Because if you punch somebody, you have this thinking about striking and violence and anger and tightness and strong. And if you're just offering your friend something to drink, but you're so drunk, your hand goes right through where his head is. Right. There's a different feeling there. Yeah. yeah and, and like even Ma didn't have a good name for it. Like in my books, I call it Chen Zhong because it's like, it's like being as heavy as a big post, but there's no big post, like intangibly so. This is kind of the best description I could find for it. And that's that's how it kind of becomes internal, is that the, the internal mechanics of the art really relies on this feeling of the body moving from the inside before it moves from the outside, yeah. which is what's called sloshing in drunken boxing. And that extreme relaxation produces an extreme amount of power or high level of power, physical power. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's in a way, it's just basic physics, right? It's just if mass, you know, forces mass times acceleration, all I have to do is get most of my mass to move. Mm -hmm. And I think where people forget on this one is that half of your body is antagonistic muscle. Right. So like, you know, when I move my arm forward, that's my tricep, not my bicep. Right. Yeah. As a human being, I have a tendency to tense my bicep because it makes me feel strong. Right. Yeah. But it's like driving a car, putting one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the changing the archetypal mindset over the many years that you've practiced drunken boxing. Um, you have my Shaolin teacher, when he talked about drunken boxing, he used the phrase he, he would, used to say, you have to be twice sober to do this. You have to be even more sober than a normal sober person because you have to, sober yeah, you have to be twice sober because you have to be so mentally present, you know, in, in order to use it effectively. Have you noticed over the years an effect that this style has had on your own like mind as far as day to day things go? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, that's a big question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the power of observation, I think, is one of the strongest things that's ever given me. Yeah. And like, like your master said, like, I like that more sober than sober. Like, uh, 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 our poem is, uh, body drunk, mind sober. Okay. That's perfect. Right? Like, you, you can't have a drunk mind. If your mind goes drunk, this is all over for you. Right. All right. And that's, I mean, most of the time when I see drunken, that's the biggest thing I, I see lacking is just, they're not even trying to fight with the, the eyes are, you know, opponent the heads all over the place there's no power in a particular direction but the i mean they're beautiful and fast and pretty yeah. to watch it's just that they're paper tigers without the intention right that's all it's about that intention um but yeah like the idea of awareness seems to me to be everything like all of the practices in drunken are related to other styles in a way like pushing hands i get people to push hands with me when i do drunken because the idea of completely going with the flow, even for a Tai Chi person, is hard to understand because they still have a rigid orthodox structure they run. Whereas, like, I don't care if I fall down. So it gets us a little bit of play involved. Do you see what I mean? Right. And for me to be able to do that, the most difficult thing I find is I've had to observe myself be afraid of people over and over and over and be able to get through it. Because, well, because like, well, I couldn't fight with drunken to save my life. I didn't even like it. I didn't want to learn it. <clears throat> it was for dumb, yeah, stupid movie stuff. Don't want it. I'm a tiger guy. That's what I wanted to be. Right, yeah. Until it was part of the curriculum and no choice in the matter. But what made drunken work the day that it started to work, I vividly remember it was the fact that I finally figured out what a sober mind was. And it was that. My body was in motion, but my mind was feeling momentum. I was observing momentum. And I didn't have a stake in what was going on. 
Like I didn't have a stake in winning anymore because like, that's what Ma kept yelling at me, right? He said, you're not fighting, you're not fighting, which was kind of like, don't have a stake in victory here. Right. The his teaching was more like, it's hard. It's interesting. I've never verbalized it that way. It's like, it's like he told us not to have a stake in winning or losing ever. The only stake you should ever have is in your own best performance. Because if I perform my very best and I lose, it could be just that you're better than I am. Right. And like, I can't be down on myself for that. Right? right. But if I lose and I go afterwards and I observe, yeah, but you were scared. Yeah, but you didn't. Yeah, but it's all those yeah, buts that Drunken has put uh, into my forefront of my mind when I practice. And that's turned into my life now because every time I get into a situation, I get this moment where I can observe what those emotions are as they come up. And then if I keep my mind sober, it stays in the present moment, right? If my mind becomes drunk, then it gets led around by anxiety into the future or depression into the past or whatever, just like all of us. Mm -hmm. Whereas that sober mind allows me to observe what the emotion is. And then the listening power of that just lets you go with the flow. You know, and that that's really what drunken boxing is, is like going with the flow in the utter extreme that it could even be violent without right. it should be like an Schieffer would always say you should win on accident no one should know that you actually even did martial arts like you yeah. should fall on the guy and hurt and you leave <laughs> that's that's really good drunken boxing because it's gone it's not even a thing to see anymore right but that's such a hard thing to attain that utter freedom so it's stage by stage by stage right you build a box in order to climb out. Wow. It's a very meditative practice. It's the only way I've made it work. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if I yeah, want to, yeah. it's just damn hard, right? So I've been trying for a long time to make it work. And I mean, I, like I said, I before, I wasn't even interested in it at first. My yeah. And what's funny is I had a, I have a Kung Fu brother, Lorne, and he uh, he was actually the guy Sifu was teaching drunken to at the beginning because Lorne wanted to learn. Yeah. And the argument Lauren and I constantly had over beers was Lauren would always ask me, why are you doing animal styles? You're not an animal. You're a man. You should be doing Kung Fu styles like a person. Cause he only wanted to do things like Wing Chun and Bak Mei. Cause people did those tigers right. and snakes. Makes sense, right. And we argued about it a lot. Actually, it was kind of fun. And now looking back, it's funny. Cause now one of my biggest kind of understanding of how, how the system really works is that drunken is an animal system. It's so. not a person system. Because if somebody gets drunk enough, <laughs> no. right? They right. lose yeah. a little bit of humanity and they're just a big ape. Yeah. And suddenly that big ape gets really dangerous because they don't know their own strength. Right. They have way too much confidence. They yeah. are almost to the point of arrogance. Right. And they don't have a lot of compassion, generally speaking. They just do things because they're emotional. So that, like, to me, that was the realization of that's what the drunk body is, is it's the animal that is the human being body. But the sober mind is the human being mind. So you have to try to keep those two paradoxically working at the same time. Right. Because it's easy to slide into a tiger because yeah. it's like, I'm a tiger. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to kill you. I'm a hungry dude. Um, but it's easy to go from there and back up. Yeah. They're two, they're like yin yang. The idea here is that yin yang is like not binary. It's it's really got to be yeah. intermingling just kind of in the right amount. Otherwise, otherwise the system doesn't work, which is why I like it. Because if I'm sparring or doing whatever, pushing hands, sticking hands, when I start losing to somebody, I can tell now that it's my mind doing it. I know the Kung Fu is okay. It's just I'm not good at it. So I'm getting in my own way, right? There's something where I'm getting led around by my emotions or something that's happening. Like I just spent, I just got to meet Lord the show for the first time this week. Yeah. You must know who he is. Of Bob course. Yeah. yeah. Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like Lo, it was the same. It was, it was amazing getting to hang out with him because he has the same sort of touch as a drunkard. He's light. He's totally alive. Yet he's so soft that there's nowhere to go. Like, you know what I mean? There's no target to go after there. It's just suicide because he's going to be smoked. The second you, you appear, he'll disappear. But it's interesting because it's like the same, the same quality from a different side of the mountain. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. It was really fantastic seeing that. Sorry, I know that might be off top. But. Not at all. I, I think that, you know, um, in my experience, you know, whenever you train with a master of any art, they have that quality. You know, it's regardless of what the art is, when they get to that point, they they, they have that quality where they're just, you know, like I'll well, say, crashing smoke. Your organization, Dawi, with uh, Jonathan, when Jonathan Bluestein wrote uh, his article on the internal ocean as yeah, a point. Great I like, I, yeah, great article. Good, yeah. And I, I actually really like the term he's coined. Internal yeah. ocean is good. Like, it's good. Yeah, he's on uh, and I think it's going to stick. I think it's going to stick too. Yeah. Like in Drunkard, um, everything's based on the gourd, right? Yeah. If everything's this, meaning the body is a hollow vessel and it's got some stuff in it. Yeah. And that that's the power, right? So I just kind of slosh the water on my opponent. And when he when I read that internal ocean, yeah, I was like, yeah, that's so similar. And it, it feels like that on other people. Totally different styles. IG guys, Bagua guys, Singy guys. There's this, there's that movement of the subtle body that is not exactly in unison with the physical body. That makes everything worse if you're you know on the receiving end of it. Yeah. It's it's amazing. I think it's a great, yeah, really hats off to him. I think that was a great article. Yeah, it was an excellent article. I think he's I think he's definitely coined a term there. I think he has too, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean I I'm gonna use it in class because it's hey, look, look at this article. It's the same thing. Yeah. Look, you know, twelve different to twelve different ways to say the same thing. That's the easiest way to teach a student. Yeah, absolutely. If one of them is gonna stick, right? You just throw everything you can and hope yeah. that something sticks. So when you when you do teach yeah. your own students nowadays with Red Jade, uh, do you do as your teacher taught you and lead them through a, a uh, foundation of other arts before you start teaching drunken or are you able to just start teaching them their drunken styles right away um that was actually one of my big projects after master ma died was i had people asking me to teach drunken and i was like not sure how to right. do it because it was built on this idea of having this foundation to break so how do i teach you to break something you don't have right yeah. right so what i ended up kind of doing was i sort of split the middle and when I do teach somebody drunken, I'll teach them the drunken uh, Jibin Gong and stuff right at the beginning. But then, pardon me, I'll contrast it directly against some old Shaolin stuff. So okay. I'll pull drills out of the mob family or whatever. And then they can, I can say, this is an orthodox movement. This is the drunken version of that same thing. And you can see, you can see the difference. Because otherwise, I, my fear is that if I were to teach somebody drunken without an orthodox background, that yeah. they'd be totally backwards. Like, I don't know if it would work in a way because how do you break something you never had in the first place, right? Like, how do you put something down that you never picked up? Right. Yeah, it is I ended up doing, yeah, is I do it instead of, instead of five years of foundations, which is basically where my worked. Um, what I do is I try to run the foundations alongside the drunken foundations and compare and contrast them. I find that if I have, if I have somebody really paying attention, we can get a lot done in a very short time that way. Because anything a student, anything a student discovers is like worth ten times anything you tell them. You know, it's oh, always absolutely. better to lead somebody to a discovery. And I find that that seems to be the process that's making that happen. It's allowing that that mind to kind of cultivate on its own, which I think is making them fast, better, faster than I was, the way I was taught. And I mean, that's my goal, truly. I feel like it's taken me a really long time to figure anything out. So it'd be really great if people learning from me got it faster than I did. Yeah. yeah using modern teaching methods, I think, is one of the, the big challenges of uh, people of our generation that have students is trying to figure out a, a different way to teach because we live, you know, for good or for bad, we live in a different world where people want things faster. And uh, it's true. I mean, and on one side, yeah, it's terrible that people want kung fu faster because yeah. it can't be done. Right. Absolutely. But at the same time, the way we're all educated in Western pedagogy, we're good teachers. Yeah. Like, I think I think our generation is really responsible for improving how Chinese martial arts are taught. Because everybody I talk to, they have words now. Do you know what right. I mean? Mastermind yeah. they have a lot of words. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said for both uh, teaching methods for sure. And, and when you've seen both sides and you can combine them, then you can use the best of both, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do, right? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that uh, you also teach Shingi Bagua and Tai Chi, right? Yep. 
Now, now is that, could you describe to me, just sort of like give me an outline of like what your general curriculum at Red Jade is like, what do, what do you, what do you usually, do you start people out in a specific style or do you teach everything, you know, depending on the person or how does the, how does it work? Okay. I mean, right now, currently I don't have a brick and mortar school. Okay. So that's something to remember, right? So I'm not doing like a temple kind of curriculum right. thing. Uh, what I do do is I have some private students. And generally, they're seeking one particular system, honestly. Mm -hmm. Some of them are the Ma system, though. They want that, the big folk shell install. So that's what we're working on, which includes all those other pieces. Uh, but a lot of the time, yeah, it'll be the ones to do Tai Chi with me or Bagua or Xingyi, Liohe or something like that. If that's the case, then I just start them there. What, what you want to work on, that's what we're going to work on. Because if you're interested, then you're going to practice. I mean, I find that if I tell somebody... Yeah, I'll teach you Xing Yi, but you got to do two years of Tantui first. They're just like, I'm out of here, buddy. Right, yeah. I'm not going to put up with it. That's not how it works. But all of those different arts have their own Jibing Gong, their own basics, their own way to start a beginner from like square one. So I, I find it's not a big deal because when I'm teaching, even in a classroom situation, I always do my best to teach everybody as an individual rather than like, you know, military style, like lining people up and Right. Yes, sir. No, sir. It's just not my thing. Yeah. You know, I prefer to, to see what's going on, see who's in the room and see what the most valuable thing I can teach that night is to those people. So it's kind of unpredictable. I have a guideline. I have a rank system. You know, if you're going through the MOS system, it's fairly extensive. Other than that, it's like any other in internal art. There's a form, a whole bunch of details, a whole bunch of internal practices to be able to get it working. And then the final culmination, ideally, is that the system starts to make the self-evolutionary changes for you. And then you start to ride that sort of wave, right? Once you put the work in. So yeah, I teach, uh, as far as Taiji, I teach a Chen Taiji. I, I trained old frame and new frame. And I trained with uh, Feng Zhichong's frame as well, which is kind of both. And then uh, I used to do a little bit of Yang style, but I really don't anymore. Bagua. It's Chung style that I teach I, uh, from Yang Wutai's lineage, primarily. I've studied with a few different guys, but that's really where I practice. And uh, as far as Xingyi Liuhe, my my teacher is uh, Xu Guoming, George Xu. So yeah. You're freezing up on me, Neil. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then Xingyi Liuhe, uh, I started studying under Shu Guoming, George Shu, out of San Francisco a few, um, 10 years ago, whenever it was, almost 10 years ago. Uh, I went down there and got my hands dirty with him after training it with uh, one of my Kung Fu brothers. So that's been where that Xingyi has been going, which is interesting. He has his own his own bent on the whole thing as well. So he's, he's quite a guy to, to follow. You've written several books, and, and one of the books that you've written uh, that I just found out about yesterday, actually, was your uh, book, uh, Secrets of Heavy Hands, I Iron Palm Companion. Could you talk a little bit about your iron palm practice? That's something else that I'm interested in. I'd like to hear your take on it. Sure, yeah. I got a really cool system. I, I learned the Ma system. I learned the Jing Wu one. Then I learned a Ma system. Then I learned one from uh, Green Dragon in Edmonton. And I learned a whole bunch of them because I was like, wanting to be a tiger guy, right? Yeah. Uh, and then my Kung Fu brother, he trained with a guy who's one of Gu Yu Chung's grand students. So Gu Yu Chung, the iron palm guy. Uh, with yeah. The bricks. yeah. Yeah. The horse. Yeah. That, that's the guy. So I find out that he trained with a grand student of Gu Yu Chung's. And he has an internal iron palm system. So that's what heavy hands is. is heavy hands is the name of the Qigong. Okay. So it's really interesting it's got three different sections it's got a qigong section which is standings 12 postures qigong it's got a bunch of qigong exercises like moving your arms in the air and then it has the bag work that most iron palm does um interestingly though it never changes into any harder materials it doesn't oh. do body at all yeah that's what's interesting is 
it's not about body hardening. It's about how much weight can you release through your body at once? So the, like even the, the bag training is done in three stages where you're releasing a single joint at a time. So your first month on the bag, you're just dropping your hand like this, trying to get your wrist to react to totally, totally relax. And then, you know, the next time it's your elbow that you're working on, then it's your shoulder, then it's Tanjong and Dante, and then you're standing and you're trying to get your knees to do it until, you know, these little movements start to have larger and larger bits of body weight going through. Like in Drunken, I call it sloshing, right? That water coming from the, the internal ocean, <laughs> the internal ocean out to the hand. So it's, it's interesting. So what I did was I wrote down for some of my students, they wanted me to write a manual for them. So I did. That's the first book about heavy hands, the, the, the Gu Yu Chung's Iron Palm book. And then this next book, Secrets of Heavy Hands, is basically keep people keep asking me questions that I've taught it to. So instead of writing the same email over and over, <laughs> I wrote a book, right. the same email over and over, right? Yeah. So it's like frequently asked questions, uh, details that weren't in the first book. You know what I mean? Uh, right. A little bit more about intention, a little bit more about breath. I go into that book I put meditation stuff into. I went a little bit deeper on it. Uh, so that's the idea is it's sort of the companion book to the practice so that if you have the practice, what will likely happen is you'll get questions and it's, it's likely those ones, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what's happening because as I've been teaching it for the last 10 or so years, it's always the same questions that come back. So that's kind of what the book is. In fact, actually one of my students today, uh, he, he's, uh, he wrote me, he just got the book and finished it. And he was like, Kate, I have an idea for the third book. So the third book in the series is going to be, I'm finally answering your questions. <laughs> That's what he says. He's trying to make an interview process for it. So oh. if there's anybody practicing it that has a question that's not in there, that'll be the third project, I guess. Fantastic. So you said that the material never changes. What, what are you using? Mung beans as the material for the bag? Just that's mung it. beans. That's and it. Do you use medicine at all? About, yeah, you use Dittajau to make sure you're, you know, yeah. You want to heal every time. Yeah. And actually, Gu Yuchung's formula is really good. It's the best one I've ever used, pretty much. Yeah, it's the only mm -hmm. one that I've ever used. I've never seen a reason to use any other one. Uh, right but, on. Yeah, Just to compare it to maybe, but you'll see how good it is then. It's really good. Yeah, I, I believe it. It's the only one that I've ever used. Do you make your own, or, or do you... Um, yeah, 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 Master Chen, my Lohan, my Lohan teacher was a doctor, so I learned all the Chinese medicine and herbology stuff from him. Oh, so I was funny. lucky that he, he helped me make stuff and taught me how to do it. So I've got some gallons of it around. Yeah. But yeah, you do. What's interesting too about the Dittajiao in that one is if you get the trad one that doesn't have anything changed, it's got pit viper in it. Yeah. It's like to that, right? The white snake, the pit viper. And the pit viper is a paralytic poison. So when you put it on your skin, it actually numbs pain. That's as good why they use it, right? right. But it also makes your skin tingle. And one of the secrets that was passed down about the heavy hands was you put the gel on before the qigong. Yeah. Interesting. You wash your hands with the gel. Yeah, right? Because yeah. if you think about it, you're trying to put all your intention in your hands. So why not just help yourself by making them hot and oh, have all of this rush to them? I thought that was really interesting. So I was told that Master Gu, he would put it on before he did the qigong. And then he would put it on right before and after the back. Because just for that, probably just for that intention, because there's not going to be a lot of micro fractures and tears if you're only using mung beans, right? Right, right. So, so I'm like, why are you using such strong gel? Because that stuff's really strong. Right. But it's so strong, it has a sensation. I yeah. think that's a big part of it, yeah. It, I've never heard that before. It makes perfect sense. Right? Like, Because it's yeah. just like, yeah. I'm trying to leave my mind somewhere. Why not use a medicine to help? Right. And that helps. It's really interesting. I don't know if it does it without the pit viper in it. I've never made that one. No, it doesn't, it doesn't tingle without the pit viper in it. It's it's just kind of there, but no. But um, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I can't wait to read that. I, I try to buy all the iron palm stuff out there that I can just because it's a, a hobby, you know, good, bad, or ugly. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting because there's, like, I really love the system. The heavy hand system to me is like, it's my, it's the one. It's even got um, two of the postures in there our iron body as well, right? It actually has an internal iron body piece, one for the front of the vest and one for the back. But it's really cool because like, then I see, uh, what was that guy's name from when I was a kid? 
iron palm guy and he could do the break that was like three bricks down four bricks down brian gray brian gray yeah i remember brian gray that's the name seeing like that's something i've never seen in real life yeah, me neither. and it, like i didn't get that from this one yeah. <laughs> you know I get that. so it's really interesting because if that's if that's what's happening by somebody else that means there's other systems that are super similar but they've got a different vein somehow to make that ability happen right kind of yeah. interesting yeah it is very it's a very interesting subject and in you come across some uh odd and unique training methods out there oh yeah i mean yeah. i think getting back to that internal ocean really that's what a, most of iron palm i think really is yeah there's like a little body hardening but it's almost like the body hardening is so my weapons don't break when i hit you because right. so much power coming that i'm worried about me not you Right, I get the feeling that's kind of what's up and why there's so much body hardening done in a lot of systems. Because it's it's not just that you're hitting somebody with a harder fist, you're hitting them harder. Yeah, oh, for right? sure. The iron palm guys. Everybody who does iron palm hits harder than most people. It's just how it works. Yeah, no question. Even, a, even what looks like a soft hit feels so much harder, you know, the heavy hands. Well, that's it, yeah. I, that's, I, I love that word, heavy, instead of hard. Hard implies tightness and trying. Heavy is lazy. I'm a jocker, though. I'm just very lazy about everything. So that's understandable, I guess. No, it's interesting. I love Iron Palm. It's one of those subjects where you're you're like evolving how your body works, like really evolving it. It's it's really controlling your subtle nervous system a lot, I think, in order to get that kind of relaxation. Yeah, I agree. I also think it has therapeutic effects. I've noticed that when I go for a period of time without training where I've done a lot of like hard physical work my whole life, when I get back into training, just the training itself, you know, increases the circulation in my hands, somehow relaxes the joints. I think it's, I think it's good for you if you do it right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's a mnemonic trigger over and over inside of us. We tell ourselves relax and let go, relax and let go. I mean, that's pure health. Get rid of your stress, relax and let go. Right. That too. Definitely good for relieving stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly so one question that i try to ask everybody that we interview is uh what do you think the future is of these arts in the world that we're in right now where do you think these arts are going what are their purpose in the modern world that's a good question i'm glad you asked that what do i think their purpose is in the modern world well not to sound too much like a weird chinese kung fu master but I really believe that Chinese martial arts are about self, self evolution. And anybody I've ever met that seriously studies them becomes a better person. It's just the way it is. It's not like the martial virtues, the Wu is like forced on people. It's just, there's a level of understanding of who you are when you practice that starts to make you interrelate with other people differently. I mean, I know myself cause I started so young. I went through so many stages of fear and then aggression and testing myself as a young man and all of these things. And all of those things were helped along by my martial arts training, that transformation. And I've met a lot of people that, you know, are my age or older that they're still the person they were when they were 18. Yeah. And boy, that's not okay. Right. <laughs> like we're evolving beings. That's, that's how this is supposed to work, I think. And it's a, it's a chance to do that. So where do I see them going? It's kind of funny, you know, man, I was talking to my wife about this today. She's been bugging me about this idea of one of my masters just passed away. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sifu Chen passed away just a few months ago. And he was my, he was my guru. He was my Yoda. Like right? That was my dad. Yeah. So it put me in this really strange existential spot where I'm like, I'm the one responsible now. Yeah. Uh, it was okay to kind of be responsible and run my martial arts school when I could not know everything because I could go mask. But now I'm in this position where it's like, he named me the guy. So I'm supposed to know the answers. I'm just a guy. And it made me think about the fact that there's an awful lot of us whose masters are going to pass or yeah. just did, or they're about to. And that means it's all of us scrubs that are about to be the lineage holders. And I don't know about you, but that scares the hell out of me. That's a scary thought. Yeah, right? I mean, have you been on Facebook? 
those people are about to be lineage holders. Yeah, no, I stay away from all that. <laughs> right. So when I when I look at that, I go, wow, you know what what needs to happen, I think, is really just responsibility. Yeah. Like if there was just a bunch of us, like Dawi, this is a great idea because it's presenting a, a sense of responsibility. Like I think martial arts are for making people better people. Agreed. Some people don't think that. Some people think it's for beating people up, and that's their thing, which is fine. But that means that a voice that's about compassion and self-evolution needs to be heard. All of us need to do that. Because that's the thing, right? Sifu goes, we're the ones who are supposed to pick it up. It's not like someone else's job anymore. Yeah. And there's a lot of us that 50, 60, 70 years old have been training lifetimes. I think that we're all sort of guilty in a way of shirking our responsibility of picking it up. You know, like someone else will take care of it. Someone else will take care of the kids and make sure they get taught right. Someone else is going to do it, right? But it's not anybody else. Who's going to do it is the people that are going to do business instead of martial arts. And they're going to go open McDojo daycares and they're going to give people belts and make a fortune. And all of us will be underground for the next generations or two. But that's a shame. We don't have to do that. I mean, if a few of us were just willing to stop being tribal, and just try to help everybody, get everybody on the same page. I mean, the Baltic Taekwondo, my Iron Palm, I don't care. You know, that doesn't matter to me. I think we all need to kind of look at it that way because we're the ones that have to set the example. All those students are looking up to us, for God's sake. Yeah. Like, no thanks. That was not what I was hoping for. It was way easier with the Chinese guy standing behind. All right, here we are. Yeah, I can't yet, think of your answer. Are. Yeah, right. Fantastic. Well, Neil, we're about out of time. Uh, can you tell people where they can find you? Find out more about Red Jade Martial Arts? Sure. So Neil Ripsky at gmail.com is the easiest way to get a hold of me. I'm doing workshops right now. I'm actually in the Middle East. I'm in Israel. Uh, so I'm going to be doing workshops here for the rest of June of 2023. And then I'm actually planning on doing my full-time intensive, which I do once a year as well. If you're interested in that, you want to get a hold of me. What I'm doing this year is I'm actually going to run a full-time intensive seven-day drunken course. So it's basically five of my advanced workshops all in a row, plus a lot of sparring and practice and things like that. And then if uh, people have it together, then maybe they'll start teaching it in their, their communities and see what's going on. I think it's a great way for us to look at what we already do and just break barriers. So... Other than that, uh, I've written a few books and lulu.com, my name, Neil Ripsky, lulu.com or Barnes and Noble or Amazon or wherever else those things go. Yeah, there should be, I think there's 17 right now. Yeah, many, many books. Plenty. Yeah, I, it turned out I had a bunch on my computer. Like, don't think I'm super smart. I had been writing on my computer for the last few years and decided I was time to put them all together. Like, wow, I've been, I never shut up. Is what it turned out to be. <laughs> Good thing too. Yeah, you you know a lot, and we're we're all glad that you're here. So uh, thanks a thank lot. You. I appreciate that. I I wonder sometimes if I'm shouting into the wind. So no, I appreciate not, it. not at all. I know many people who are uh, glad that you're that that you're out there. Think very highly of you. So I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me today. Thanks, Neil. Oh, Hope I to talk to you again. Soon. All right. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.